left off at the last hour saying that we now need to look at the constitutional defenses. These are very commonly tested, of course. The first element of the constitutional defenses is regarding this presumption. And the rule is that at common law, we presume that defamatory statements were false. And that's still true when you have a private party suing a private party. Many jurisdictions still have that. <coughs> but if uh, <coughs> your if the plaintiff is a public figure or a public official or the matter is a matter of public concern, the statement is a matter of public concern, we do not presume the falsity of the defamatory statement and the plaintiff must prove that the statement is false. In the case of a public figure or a public official, we need first of all to decide who these people are. And a public figure is a person who uh, has sought notoriety, who's, who makes a living as a result of notoriety, basketball players, movie stars, uh, uh, musicians, uh, people who make a living out of being notorious, sports figures and so forth. Those are public figures. Public officials, of course, are people who are in the, uh, the government in some way that they are speaking, uh, they're, they're, they're in the government in some way that uh, high enough in the government that we want to allow the public to defame this, uh, want to allow the public to speak freely about this person uh, without them feeling like they're going to be sued. Uh, it doesn't always have to be a high public official. For example, a police officer, for our purposes, for defamation purposes, is a public figure. So you can speak ill of a police officer, and if the police officer wants to sue about it, they've got to meet these very high standards, uh, the same as a public figure standard, same as a basketball player or something. Just because as a matter of public policy, we want people to, to be able to speak evil of police officers if they want to do that. The, uh, the public figure, public official, of course, people high in the government such as uh, elected officials, judges usually, um, people, cabinet members, uh, that sort of thing. These are all public officials. If the bar examiners um, uh, give you a public official who is at such a level and it's now not so clear whether or not you, uh, that person should be treated as a public uh, official, resort to the policy. Point out that the underlying policy is to give people the freedom to speak, speak uh, evil, if you like, uh, of their elected officials and other people who are in charge of running uh, parts of the government and that if this person is high enough so that it's a matter of constitutional policy that you should allow people to speak evil of that person, then you treat them like a public official. The uh, public figure, public official, if the um, defendant has uh, speaks defamatorily of one of these people, the rule is that that person, your president, your elected official, a police officer, must produce clear and convincing evidence that the person speaking knew it was false, known falsity, or reckless disregard for the truth. And you can get punitive damages, that person can get punitive damages if they can prove all of this. Clear and convincing evidence is the standard that the person speaking knew it was false. And here, when you say knew it was false or reckless disregard for the truth, we, we're not applying like negligent standards. Uh, we're not saying that uh, the newspaper who printed this could have easily found the truth. That's not the test. The test is did the newspaper print it almost uh, 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 wanting to not know the truth. In other words, if I publish it now, and I don't know the truth, I can sell a bunch of newspapers 
then I can make some kind of a retraction of something tomorrow. So it's not a test of whether it was negligent for me to negligence for me to publish it now. That's not the test. The test is did I do it recklessly or did I practically know it was untrue, but I didn't want to know the truth in order to sell the newspaper. That's when it's reckless disregard. Very high standard, much higher than ordinary negligence. I have to, in effect, not want to know the truth. Or either I knew it was false or I didn't want to know the truth because I wanted to sell the newspapers. And you can get punitive damages in that case. Uh, the uh, matter of public concern, this is the case where you think someone got smallpox or for some other reason there's a uh, matter of public concern. In that case, when you speak badly of this person saying they've got smallpox, negligence is the standard, much lower than these standards that we have over here. Negligence is the standard um, and the person who is the plaintiff can only get actual damages, no punitive damages, just the actual damages that they can actually prove, no punitives. So that's how this system works. What we need to do next is to look at some uh, uh, problems uh, on the, that have been used on the bar exam and apply this structure to that problem. The problem that we're going to look at is the one assigned for today from the July 1992 bar exam involving Dan, State University Law School, and Teacher Jones. Let's go through this problem, and as we go through the problem, I will identify the, the issues often on, as we go through and facts come up, which point to various issues here. That's the best time to point to that issue. When you answer the question, I encourage you to answer it in the order that you see here on the board. That is a convenient and effective way to answer the question. So again, I will point to issues as they arise, but as you, when you answer, do it this way. First paragraph. Dan, a student at State University Law School, posted on the law school bulletin board the following type notes. Professor James gave an A grade last semester to a woman in return for sexual favors. The facts are widely known and talked about. And so that's what's on the bulletin board. Professor James gave a grade for sex and the facts are widely known and talked about. Uh, now, you see, of course, uh, do we have a defamatory statement concerning the plaintiff? Well, this statement would certainly lower Professor James' esteem in the eyes of the respectable members of the faculty. You don't need inducement or innuendo because you don't need any additional facts and you don't need, uh, this is not a statement that can be taken in several ways, it's defamatory, period. So you have the defamatory statement concerning the plaintiff. Well, in this case, the plaintiff was named. So we don't have a colloquium issue. Now, as you probably know, uh, the uh, Professor James, uh, the, the person that really gave the A was someone uh, with a similar name from a different school named Teacher James. It wasn't our Professor James at all. That doesn't matter. If reasonable people would have taken this to mean our Professor James, then he's been identified and he's been defamed. So we do have a defamatory statement by using the definition, and that's how to get the maximum points out of it. And we do have it concerning the plaintiff because the plaintiff was named. Continuing. The statement about sexual favors was true of a different teacher, also named James. We call that person Teacher James. So we've already dealt with that who had been fired from his job at a nearby college as a result. But that's okay. People obviously thought they were talking about our Professor James. After all, he was on the bulletin board of this law school, and so naturally people would think they're talking about this Professor James at this law school. Dan knew that Teacher James had been fired, but did not know why. 
then honestly believe that Professor James was the one who gave the A grade for sexual favors. So Dan believes it, honestly believes it, and that's interesting, but it doesn't change anything. So far we have a defamatory statement concerning the plaintiff. Let's look at the publication. Was there intent to publish? Obviously, putting it on the bulletin board is an intent to publish. But we don't have a republisher yet. Later on, as you know, a newspaper reporter is going to take a picture of that and publish it in the newspaper. That'll be a republisher. We don't have that yet. So far we have defamation concerning the plaintiff's intent to publish. Let's look at damages as it stands right now. Well, looking at the damages, uh, that the, is it libel or slander? This is obviously the libel case. If it's a libel case, give a definition of what libel is. And then this is probably libel per se. It's libel per se because it's libel on its face. You don't need any of the helpers. You don't need colloquium, inducement on any window. It's in print. That's libel per se. Uh, the, uh, you don't need the slander part. So, so far what we have is part one, the commentary statement concerning the claim that's been published, and we have a pre damages. We have the existence of the presumption of loss of reputation. Professor James doesn't have any money damages yet because Professor James has not been fired or demoted or anything that causes money damages. But he has been damaged in his reputation. So we have the first three of these elements satisfied. We look to defenses, defenses, absolute privilege, uh, and uh, qualified privilege as well. The, if Professor James really is uh, trading grades for sex, then of course there is one needs to report this. And the student should have reported it to the dean or someone at the school who had the authority to deal with it. But to publish it broadly in this way uh, is exceeding his privilege. And so even though he may have had a qualified privilege, he has a qualified privilege. And if Dan had uh, disclosed this to the dean or someone, Dan would be acting within his qualified privilege. He's not, and so we don't have that. Then comes the constitutional defenses. Well, uh, uh, if his, we would don't, we, at common law, we presume the falsity of the statement. At common law, we presume the falsity of the statement, and uh, but unless the person being defamed is a public figure, public official, or matter of public concern. Well, the, a law professor is not a public figure, doesn't seek notoriety and make a living in that way, or her living in that way. A law professor is not a public official, and is this a matter of public concern? Well, maybe. You can make an argument that this may be a matter of public concern because if there is someone at a public law school giving grades for sex, that at least the people at that law school, all the students, which may be a large number, would be concerned about that. And so this may be a matter of public concern, but it is not, but Professor James is not a public figure or a public official. Uh, therefore, we don't have the, uh, the public official or public figure ruled, but we go to the matter of public concern. And in that case, was, uh, was Dan negligent? He clearly can make an argument for negligence here. Duty, not to expose others to unreasonable risk of harm. Breach, certainly, uh, this was, uh, this is breach uh, by there are four ways that you can establish breach of duty. It can be the, uh, the negligence per se. If you have violation of a criminal statute, we don't have that. We have violation of the duties of, 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 of the standards of one's profession or skill. Dan didn't do that. We have the balancing test. That is the risk created versus the justification. Now that's where you'd probably go. You'd say, the uh, risk that this person, the, the Dan honestly believed it, but should have been a lot more careful. This is so disastrous that the more damaging something is, 
the more careful you have to be before you do it. You know, if you're driving on a mountain road and you drive one inch off the pavement and you're down in the sort of ravine and you're dead, as opposed to if you're driving on the highway and you drive one inch off the pavement and it's just kind of noisy and you get back on the pavement. So the more disastrous something is, the more careful you are before you do it. And so here, the consequences to Professor James are so severe that a person has an obligation to be more careful before you do that. And that's how Dan reached his duty of care because the, when you do the risk justification analysis, there's enormous potential harm and very little justification for not being a lot more careful. So you can prove that Dan was negligent and Professor James can recover the actual damages. And these are not just money damages now, because we're talking about liable, and not just, you know, loss of pecuniary money of damages, is there some reputation loss here. And although it will be difficult to uh, establish the amount of the, the dollar value for the loss of reputation by Professor James, difficult to establish a dollar amount that remember there's a presumption that the loss of reputation does exist because this, this is liable. Since there's a presumption that the loss of reputation exists, then uh, you, you've got some damages even if it's only one dollar. But of course, Professor James gets to argue how much he or she should recover for that and there'll be no punitive damages. So continuing to read, we're now at line 16. On the day after Dan posted the type notice, Ned, who is an editor of the Daily Record, which is a local newspaper, published in the Daily Record a clear picture of the posted notice, okay. uh, commenting only that the notice was posted on the local law school bulletin board. Well, clearly, the Ned and the Daily, uh, Daily Record are republishers. Ned is a republisher, and so is the Daily Record newspaper. They are separate individuals. The Daily Purpose Daily newspaper is probably a corporation, and uh, it is um, if it's a corporation, then uh, you know it can be liable for the defamation also. So Ned is a republisher, and the uh, a Daily uh, reported as a republisher. They will be liable also. Continuing the next paragraph, Professor James had given only one A grade the previous semester. Oh my. This was to a woman named Pam. Okay. Uh, who had never been intimate with Professor James. So she has a cause of action also. Let's look at her. As to her, is this a defamatory statement concerning her? Certainly. Uh, the, uh, it, it lowers her esteem among the eyes of the respectable members of the community, namely her co-students. Uh, it was, cons well, we don't know if she was named or not yet, but we'll see. We might need some colloquium. But you go right through the rest. Let's get the rest of the information about Pam before we put Pam through the rest of the analysis here. Her grade had appeared, this is Pam's grade, Pam's grade had appeared alongside her secret examination number on Professor James's list of grades, okay, which had been posted on the bulletin board. Pam was never identified publicly by Professor James or the law school as the recipient of the A grade. Well, let's see now. If Pam is going to sue, Pam will say, you defamed uh, the statement is defamatory. It's concerning her, but now you've got to use colloquium. You have to use colloquium because she wasn't specifically named. And the question is, did people know who she was? Well, you'd make the argument, probably yes. One person gets an A in the class, they're probably going to tell their friends, I got the A. So their friends would probably know who it was. Uh, even if her friend didn't know who it was, she'd, you, there's only a few people out of the class who you sort of know are the super students and either one of them might have gotten the A and so it's down to a small group, group defamation. So uh, 
using either colloquium or group defamation, it was concerning Pam. Additionally, uh, remember that someone at the school knows how to connect the secret exam numbers to the person, the school administration, the school staff, somebody's got that connection. So as to that person who knew who, uh, who the secret number belonged to, that person, you don't even need to use colloquium for that person. So there's one person at least who knows both colloquium and group defamation to identify Pam. Uh, and now let's see what we're being asked. Well, let's go through with Pam again. The statement was published. It was on the bulletin board. Uh, damages, Pam will say uh, libel per se. Well, at least as to the one person who knows who Pam is, that's libel per se. Uh, generally, maybe that could be done by computer or something, and you may have to use libel per quad using libel per quad because she used colloquium to figure out who she was. And in the case of libel per quad, is there a presumption that she suffered loss of reputation? The answer is split of authority. Some jurisdictions no, others yes, and others it's about um, if it was uh, uh, if the and libel per quad, if the written libel per quad that you needed colloquium for if it was about a subject matter that would have been slander per se and here it was about her sexual activities and therefore uh, uh, in, uh, in jurisdictions where, you, where the libel per quad you presume the loss of reputation if it was about a slander per se subject it was about a slander per se subject and then secondly in many jurisdictions will will give you a presumption of loss of reputation for a libel per quad anyway, and it's only a few jurisdictions that say no, they won't do it. So do your three-way split of authority here, and then as to Pam, the census, uh, once again, if someone really thought this was true, they perhaps could go to the dean of someone they have a qualified privilege but this certainly greatly exceeded the qualified privilege. And finally, none of the constitutional defenses apply. Um, I, well, maybe the one of public concern. You could argue that this was a matter of public concern, but still, the ban was negligent for the same reason we talked about before, and Pam could collect whatever her actual damages were. Again, she has no money damages, but she has lost her reputation and she can try to place a value on that. So now let's look at the cause of the question. First call, what legal claims and defenses should be asserted by Professor James against Pan, Ned, and the Daily Record? Now, uh, the, uh, uh, please notice that they didn't ask you about defamation. Defamation is obviously one of the key suits that you would bring but since they didn't ask you about defamation, that means that you not only need to discuss defamation, but also talk about invasion of privacy and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Um, we've talked about defamation, but as to the invasion of privacy, holding her up in false light, well, the, uh, this is a statement which is false in this case, but it also usually false light is where the statement is true, a true statement, but it holds the person up in false light, like walking in front of the American Nazi flag when that wasn't what that politician stood for. Well, in our case, the statement is true rather than false, so we don't really have a false light. But we do have number three, the uh, intentional infliction of severe emotional distress. You can certainly make out that case, claiming that Dan's conduct was extreme and outrageous. And if his conduct was extreme and outrageous and was intended to inflict emotional distress on both Professor James and on her, that's your case for that. So they ask you about suits against Dan, and against Dan you have defamation, and number three here, against Ned, well, 
Ned republished it, and the same arguments go for Ned and the Daily Record republished, and the same argument goes for the Daily Record. Now, please point out that Dan is liable for the republications also. Dan put it on a bulletin board, and then it went out in the newspaper. All of the harm caused by the newspaper. You could argue that that is foreseeable. It has to be the republication has to be foreseeable. Uh, and did Dan foresee that kind of broad republication? I don't know. Make your argument that if it was foreseeable, then Dan is liable for all that newspaper coverage also. It looks like Dan was hoping to get as much broad coverage of these facts as possible, and therefore, arguably, the republication in the newspaper was foreseeable. The, so that takes care of the first call. And the second call is what legal claims and defenses should be uh, asserted by Pam, Dan, and Ned? Well, what legal claims, pardon me, what legal claims should be asserted in a suit So the first one asks you, what, uh, the first call of the question is, what legal claims and defenses should be asserted in a suit by Professor James against these people? And the second one is the same thing by Pam against these people. So we've gone through both of them. Professor James has already sued, Pam has already sued, and we understand how you would organize your answer organize it according to the structure that you've seen here on the board. I would organize it according to one, two, three, four, and five. Now, uh, it, it, there are other uh, uh, there's another defamation question which has been assigned for homework and when you do it please use this structure unless you have some other structure that you like and this isn't the only possible structure but this is uh, I think very convenient easy to follow now the second subject that we want to cover for tonight is product liability Product liability is the uh, uh, cause of action that one might bring if you are injured because of a defective product. Someone makes a product and you get injured and you bring a lawsuit. What theories and what are the details of those theories for suing someone for injury caused by a defective product? Well, let's take a look at those. The, uh, there are three primary claims that people make in the case of harm caused by a defective product. And those are the strict liability, The second one is negligence. And the third is breach of warranty. In each case, uh, the person is strict. If, if the product was defective, the rule is there's strict liability the harm caused by the defective product, but the harm must be caused by the defective product. So the next major branch here is causation. This means that uh, if you establish that the product was defective, then you next need to go to causation to see if the harm was caused by the defective product. Negligence, 
even if the manufacturer or designer of the product acted negligently, you still have to show that the negligence was the cause of the harm. And finally, breach of warranty. If you warrant that the product will behave in a certain way, you warrant that it's safe. You make some other warranty about the product. And in fact, it's not true that the breach of warranty, but you have to show that that breach of warranty was the cause of the harm. And causation, damages, of course, and uh, look to any defenses which uh, may occur inside of these. We begin with the rule on strict liability. Strict liability for the harm caused by a defective product is found in the restatement at section I can get this point here. So the restatement says, in the 402A, says that uh, if a product is defective and it causes harm, there is strict liability for everyone in the commercial chain of distribution if the product was defective when it left that person. So if Detroit manufactures a car and the car is sold to a car distributor who sells it to a local car dealer who sells it to the plaintiff, if the car was defective when it left the manufacturer, all of those people are strictly liable. If the car had defective brakes when it left the manufacturer, all of those people are strictly liable. Um, if you manufacture a concrete cutter, as we have in today's problem, and the concrete cutter has some subparts, it's like the car in Detroit having some, uh, having a brake system, or a steering system, or tires, or whatever it's got that makes up the car. These sub-assemblers make some product and they sell that product to General Motors. Or in the case of the concrete cutter, someone made the blade for the concrete cutter. And they sold that blade to the, uh, to the, uh, the manufacturer of the concrete cutter. And that manufacturer then sold it probably to some distributor. And the distributor then sold it to the wholesaler. And the wholesaler sold it to our plaintiff. And if the product, if the blade was defective, then Everybody in the commercial chain of distribution is strictly liable for the harm caused by the defective blade. Now you can see that the big, a big thing here is to prove that the blade was defective and to prove that the product was defective. So we're going to need some rules about how you decide whether or not the product was defective. Because if it was defective, if it meets the requirement for being defective, everybody uh, who was in the commercial chain is strictly liable if the product was defective when it left in. So proving defectiveness is a big deal. On the other hand, the other cause of action people frequently bring is for negligence. Now, in the case of negligence, we're looking at conduct of people. People behave negligently. Products are defective. So in the case of the strict liability, we're looking at um, we're looking at the product, not the behavior of people. In the case of negligence, we're looking at the behavior of people. Did they behave negligently? If they behave negligently, negligent design, negligent manufacturing, negligent warning, negligent instructions, any of that stuff, any negligence here that caused the harm, strict liability for that. Finally comes the breach of warranty, which is a third theory not used so much nowadays, but still good for exam purposes. Breach of warranty, uh, a product, uh, if you, when, when, if you buy a product from me, you buy the product from me, if I make promises to you about this product as a part of our deal, in other words, a part of the bargain that we made, is you're getting the hardware and you're getting some promises from me. Okay. Well, those promises that you get are called a warranty. And if uh, 
the product doesn't live up to my warranties, then that's a breach of warranty. These warranties can be expressed in that I told you the product will behave in a certain way. That's, a, that's an express warranty. But the warranty can also be implied as a matter of law. For example, they're uh, under the UCC, 2-3, 13, 14, and 15, uh, there are implied warranties. And these warranties say that, that even if I say nothing to you about this new product that I'm selling to you, that it is, that it is, uh, there's an implied warranty that this product is, I'm impliedly promising you as a matter of law, even if I say nothing to you, and it's implied, I'm impliedly promising you that this product is fit for ordinary use. I'm impliedly promising it's fit so that it is adequately packaged, it's adequately contained in the package. I'm impliedly promising to you that the instructions for how to use it are adequate, that any warnings that need to be there are adequate warnings. So all these things are implied as a matter of statute, and we'll go through that in just a minute. But the point I'm getting at is that the warranties here can be either expressed or implied. They can be expressed or they can be implied. And the express warranty can be because I told you, or it can be because it's written on the on the on the item that you bought from me. Uh, if uh, I'm selling you a uh, lawnmower, and there's a tag on the lawnmower that promises you it'll behave in a certain way, um, that's an implied warranty. Uh, even the name of a product, I mean, that's an express warranty. If I have a tag. Uh, even the name of the product can be an express warranty. For example, there was a, a bar question where a birth control product was called Bayban. B-A-Y-B-A-N. And, of course, the, uh, the implication is that it will ban pregnancy. And if the product didn't do that, you could claim an express warranty. Uh, also, express warranties that can be modeled. If, you, if I'm coming to buy this from you and there's a working model in the store that shows me how it's used or how it works or something, models or labels uh, and any of that sort of stuff can be an express warranty. So if there has been an express warranty and it was breached, go to causation, implied warranties, and it was implied warranties are in the statute, implied by statute. Uh, and in, the, in either case, uh, so these, ex, these express warranties here can be, uh, can be the um, oral statement, can be statements. It can be names, models, samples, etc. So any of that sort of stuff can be an express warranty, and um, the implied warranty of my statute, I'll give you these numbers here in just a second. So what we have then is that in a situation where a person has been injured by a product, we can make several claims. We can make one claim that the product was defective and we need a rule for what's defective. The product was defective and therefore everybody in the chain of distribution is strictly liable. We can claim that the people who designed or made or manufactured the product acted negligently. For example, a car that is, uh, is made in such a way that it's supposed to have four lug bolts holding the wheel on, and it comes out of the factory with only one lug bolt, well, somebody was negligent, okay? And you can use resistance and say that someone, someone must have been negligent and uh, that in order for this to happen, more likely than not somebody was negligent, more likely than not the person who was negligent was the car manufacturer. And that gives you a resistor. You can also establish negligence uh, in other ways. For example, if a product is dangerous and it should, it's, uh, 
it's, a, it's, a, it's a poison that ought to have a skull and crossbone on it. And there's a statute that says, got to put a skull and crossbone on this kind of a product. And they don't put it there. That might be negligence per se. Or uh, the, uh, so you can use the regular means of negligence to establish negligence. And the warranties, we will talk more about those also. So you establish the wrong, go to causation and go to damages. And that's how you do these product liability questions. So what we need to do then is to spell out more detail in each of these three categories so we can see how to do the analysis. We begin with number one, strict liability. Um, we have to prove that the product was defective. How do we prove that the product was defective? statement forward to A and the statement forward to A says that uh, there is strict liability for a product in a defective condition unreasonably dangerous. condition unreasonably dangerous. Strict liability for that. So the problem problem then is to determine if the product is in a uh, this term, this whole term, defective condition unreasonably dangerous, is together a term of art. The whole thing kind of stays together. Defective condition unreasonably dangerous. Uh, now for example, let me suppose that you are buying a bicycle and the bicycle has a scratch. A brand new bicycle that you're buying at the store has a scratch on the fender. Well, you know, if you saw that before you bought it, you could say to the person, I don't want this bicycle, I want another one. It's defective. But that defective condition does not make the bicycle unreasonably dangerous. Whereas if this same bicycle uh, is designed in such a way that the handlebars come off from time to time unexpectedly when you're riding it, well that's a defective condition that makes it unreasonably dangerous. So the whole term stays together, defective condition unreasonably dangerous, the strict liability for that. How do you decide if the product is defective condition unreasonably dangerous? Well, the, uh, the unreasonably dangerous part uh, means that it is interpreted to mean that if if the uh, if a reasonable consumer had known about this type of danger, would the reasonable consumer uh, decide that's too dangerous for me? That's unreasonably dangerous. I don't want it. For example, if a reasonable consumer knew that a an electric lawnmower with fast rotating blades that every once in a while one of the blades comes off while the motor is spinning in full speed and could do great havoc of course. If the consumer knew that the blade comes off once in a while, would the consumer say, oh that's okay? Or would the consumer say, oh no, that's too dangerous for me, I don't want that, that's unreasonably dangerous. That's how it's decided. Reasonable consumer they would have said that's too dangerous, I don't want it, that's unreasonably dangerous. The, the uh, defective condition part, remember they stay together, defective condition and reasonably dangerous, but we, we have to look at them kind of separately, but they, it's a combination that works. The defective condition part means that the product was defect, can be defective in a number of ways. condition, we can have a design defect, 
we can have can be a manufacturing defect. It can be a failure to warn. Can be inadequate instructions. And you can see that uh, the uh, these first two are really sort of hardware defects. These two here. Whereas these last two are, in effect, software defects. Now, we don't refer to these in the legal system as hardware and software, but I think it helps to make the point that uh, this is something wrong with the product, this is something wrong with the instructions and warnings and so forth about how to use it. Either of these can make the product defective if these are, are inadequate. So if the product is defective, did that make it unreasonably dangerous to use the standard we just talked about? Now, we know that in today's problem, there is a, uh, there's a uh, concrete cutter. And let's uh, kind of apply this as we go along. Let's take the problem of Peter's uh, from the February 97 bar. In the February 97 bar, the, the product in that case was a concrete cutter. And so we're going to, rather than go through all of these and then come back to the concrete cutter, uh, rather than going through all of these and then coming back to the concrete cutter, what we want to do is to apply it kind of as we go along. So in our case, we're talking about strict liability, was this concrete cutter in a defective condition, unreasonably dangerous, and causation and damages? Well, let's take a look. Let's read the facts here. Peters is a suburban homeowner who decided to resurface with bricks the concrete area surrounding his swimming pool. Okay, so he's going to cut up the concrete and replace them with bricks. He purchased from HomeCo. Now, HomeCo is obviously the retailer who sells these things. A local home improvement store, a concrete cutter manufactured by Conco. Concrete cutter manufactured. So, Con Conco manufactured it. HomeCo is the retailer. And it had a blade manufactured by BladeCo. So, we have a sub-assembler made the blade, sold the blade to Conco, Conco installed it uh, and made the concrete cutter and sold it wholesale to Homeco and then Homeco sold it to our plaintiff, Peters. Uh, he then, he being Peters, Peters then took the concrete cutter home and assembled it following the instructions provided by Conco. Now the reason they had him take the concrete cutter home and assemble it is because, as you know from having read this problem, that the switch on the concrete cutter, the off switch, is located in a terribly dangerous position, way down there where his foot has to reach down near the rotating blade to turn it off. And if he could have seen this in the store if it was on display and he bought it there. But here he bought it in a box and took it home so I didn't have any way of knowing that until he got home. So our facts then, just to re re review them before we take our break, the facts are that Blade Co. manufactured the blade, sold it to Conco, Conco assembled the blade with other things, made the concrete cutter, put it in the box, shipped it to Home Co. Peters bought it from Home Co., took it home, assembled it, and now things are going to go wrong. And when we come back from our break, we'll look at those items. Let's take 10.